our skills or hone them at least. Okay, so today I wanted to start it off with question three. This is question three from the additional problems at the end of chapter 15. And it's just a KSP problem that we're asked to solve. Let me make sure I got my calculator here. Okay, so things you should have today when uh, we go over practice problems would be some scratch paper, calculator, uh, pencils. Okay, so let's pretend we're on the exam here. It says calculate the solubility in moles per liter of magnesium fluoride in a 1.0 or 0 0.10 molar solution of potassium fluoride. So this is a common ion effect problem, isn't it? All right, we're dealing with the common, common ion effect. OK, because you know that potassium fluoride is a soluble compound and it's going to completely ionize 100 percent to give you potassium ions and fluoride ions. If we're starting out with an initial concentration of potassium fluoride of 0 0.10 molar, we have none of these. We know that it's going to completely ionize 0.10 0 0.10 such that at equilibrium we'll have none of the potassium fluoride and we'll have a concentration of 0 0.10 molar potassium ions and 0 0.10 molar fluoride ions. Now the only ion that we're concerned with is the fluoride ion because fluoride ions are present in magnesium fluoride, right? So that means if we've already got some potassium fluoride in our solution that the concentration of the fluoride ions is already at 0.1. So that means that when we go to write out an equilibrium expression for our magnesium fluoride, which is an insoluble compound, but again, we know it's going to be slightly soluble. We have magnesium ions and we have twice as many fluoride ions, right? Because it's MgF2, not MgF. We know that our initial concentration of magnesium ions is going to be zero, but our initial concentration of fluoride ions is 0 0.10 molar, right? Which is coming from here. So what's going to happen is we're going to lose some of the magnesium fluoride going into solution. We're going to form some magnesium ions and we're going to form 2x amount of fluoride ions. So that at equilibrium, again, we don't concern ourselves with the concentration of a solid. We're going to have X is representing our magnesium ions in 0 0.10 plus 2X is representing the concentration of our fluorides. I'm going to ignore the plus 2X. The reason why is because the KSP, which is written here in the problem, is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 9. This concentration is much greater than 100 times the KSP, and so I'm pretty sure we can ignore that. So we know that the expression of our KSP would, again, only consider ions that are aqueous. It doesn't consider the solid. So we have the concentration of magnesium 2 plus ions times the concentration of the fluoride ions squared because of the coefficient 2. Our KSP is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 9 equal to the concentration of magnesium ions times 0 0.10 squared. And then we have 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by 0 0.01. So we get that the concentration of our magnesium ions is going to be equal to 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. And that's going to be the molar solubility of our magnesium fluoride because the ratio is one to one for a magnesium fluoride to our magnesium. And so the molar solubility of the magnesium fluoride will also be 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative seven molar in that 0.1 molar solution of potassium fluoride. If we want to double check, um, Oh, yeah, I already mentioned the check, so we're not going to do the check. We already did that. So there we go. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one or if you have any questions.
If not, we're going to move on to some other problems. Okay, good. Thanks, Katie. Great, great. Okay, let's move on. I'm going to skip this one. This one is a pretty tough problem. Um, I'm going to skip this one for now. And I don't have a problem like this on the actual exam or on the practice exam. So I'm going to skip that one and concentrate our time on things that um, are going to be more pertinent to our actual exam and to the practice exam. So this is a question from the book. So the rest of the problems that I picked today, this is from, from OpenStax. And remember, you have the solutions manual for OpenStax. It's free. You can download that. I would recommend it. I have it saved to my hard drive. So if I ever decide that I want to look at the solution to a problem, I can do that. Okay, so let's see here. And also, I'll just point something out here that um, for the OpenStax problems, now I don't have my OpenStax open right now. <laughs> But if you look at our textbook, and I'm sure I'm sure that you've all figured this out probably faster than I did. But if you look at the problems, a lot of the problems have, you know, KSPs missing or KFs missing or things like that. So since those are in there, you're going to have to look them up in the appendices. So, for example, um, for this one here, you'd need the KF for this coordination complex. And I went ahead and looked it up. It's in Appendix K. So again, Appendix K says formation constants, constants for complex ions. So I just looked it up. You know, zinc 2 plus and the four cyanide ions give you the zinc um, uh, CN4 2 minus co uh, coordination complex. And it gives you the KF there. So again, I know that in my problems, I tried to... Um, I try to always include those things. And again, you don't have to memorize any of those. If you need them on the exam, I'm going to give it to you. OK, I'm not going to leave you like, oh, you're supposed to memorize a bunch of KFs. No, that's ridiculous. OK, so question is just asking us, um, calculate the equilibrium concentration of zinc ions in a 0 0.30 molar solution of this coordination complex. So we have the zinc uh, CN4 2 minus coordination complex. So I decided to examine this in terms of the KD, the dissociation constant. And if you're like, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, we talked about KD last class. So let's review. We have our coordination complex. Okay, we have our zinc CN4 2 minus. Okay, and that is going to dissociate because I'm going to use the KD into zinc ions plus four cyanide ions like that. Now, if you flip this reaction around, if you have zinc 2 plus plus 4 CN minus, again, this is in appendix K, that's the formation. So the KF is equal to, what is it? Uh, let me, I'm trying to read it here. It's 2.1 times 10 to the power of 19. Therefore, this is going to be the KD, since this is dissociation that I have drawn up here. The KD is the reciprocal of the KF. So we have 1 over, what is it? 1 over 2.1, 2.1 2 .1 times 10 to the power of 19. And so we get that our KD for this reaction, which again is going to be equal to the concentration of zinc ions times the concentration of cyanide ions to the power of 4 divided by the concentration of the coordination complex. There we go. OK, and that is going to be equal to 4.8, 4.8 times 10 to the negative 20. OK, so now we have our KD. Now we're going to set up an ice table. So I'm going to copy this and paste it so I can make a nice ice table down here. So um, copy and paste that down here. There we go. All right, so let's make our ice table. Initially, we have 0 0.30 molar. We're going to assume that we have none of either of these. We have some kind of change. We're going to gain x here, and we're going to gain 4x here, right, because the stoichiometric coefficient is 4. At equilibrium, we have around 0 0.30. Why? Because the initial concentration is much higher than 100 times my KD value. And here we have X and here we have 4X. So then we get that our KD 
which is equal to 4.8 times 10 to the negative 20 is going to be equal to x times 4x to the power of 4 divided by 0 0.30. So that's going to be equal to, you take 4 to the power of 4, so take your 4 and you take it to the power of 4, so that's 256x to the power of 5, 256x to the fifth power divided by 0 0.30. I rearrange that to solve for x. x is going to be equal to the fifth root of 5.6 times 10 to the negative 23. Make sure you know how to take a fifth root. If you don't know how to use the fifth root function, you could just say 5.6 times 10 to the negative 23 to the power of 0.2 or one fifth. Either way, you're going to end up with, oops, what happened there? You're going to end up with, come on, your X, which is the concentration of your zinc ions, is being equal to 3.5 times 10 to the negative 6 molar, like that. So again, you could have solved this problem using the formation constant. I just chose to, to do it using dissociation since you're starting out with the concentration of the coordination complex. Again, just like I showed you, I think it was last class, that you could solve a problem using Ka or Kb or one of those, or Kf or Kd, I can't remember which one I did. But basically, I asked my students, I said, you know, could I use, if I, have K, if I use Kd, could I use Kf? And my student, one of my students said, you know, or I said, will it work? And one of the students answered, it should. You know, which is a really good way of answering and saying, yeah, if you do it correctly, it will work. OK, so if you want to try this problem using KF, by all means, do that. OK, but the ice table will give you the exact same answer. All right, let's move on to question 102, which I think is a really good problem because I put a question similar to this on your practice exam. And I'm 99 percent sure there's one that's similar to it on your um on your actual exam, here's a heads up for my people who come to class. It says, which of the following compounds when dissolved in 0 0.10 molar solution of perchloric acid has a greater solubility than in pure water? So what it's saying is that acid is going to help you dissolve some of these compounds, yes, and some of them, no. Okay. Now, you know that if I have 0 0.01 molar solution of strong acid okay which is hclo4 perchloric acid that when i take that hclo4 and i put it in water since it's a strong acid it's going to dissociate to give me hydronium ions plus perchlorate ions now hydronium is a strong acid okay that's what we get when we put a strong acid in water, whether it's HCl or perchloric acid or hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid, nitric acid. We're always going to end up with hydronium due to the leveling effect. So now let's evaluate each one of these ionic compounds. If we have copper chloride, calcium carbonate, manganese 2 sulfide, lead 2 bromide, and calcium fluoride. Well, let's write what kind of ions we would get from this. Well, this is copper one chloride. You'd get a copper one ion and a chloride ion. This would dissociate to give you a calcium ion and a carbonate ion. Manganese two sulfide would dissociate to give you a manganese ion and sulfide. Lead two bromide would give you a lead two ion plus two bromide ions. And then calcium fluoride will dissociate to give you calcium and two fluorides. Well, an acid, H3O plus, is going to react with a base. All right, it's going to react with a base. And so the base has to be strong enough in order to react with the acid. What were the strong acids again? The strong acids were perchloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydroiodic acid. These are all very strong acids. 
Okay. Therefore, their conjugate bases, the perchloride ion, the hydrogen sulfate ion, the nitrate ion, the chloride ion, the bromide ion, and the iodide ion, these are all weak, weak bases. Remember, the stronger the acid, the weaker its conjugate base. Therefore, those weak bases will, will not will not react, react with H3O plus. Right? They're too weak to react with H3O plus. And so, how will we know when one of these ionic compounds is going to dissolve more in water? We have to examine the ions. If the anion is the conjugate base of a weak acid, then it is going to react with the H3O plus decrease its concentration, which is going to push the equilibrium to this direction, okay? Let's pick something simple. We'll start with the fluoride, right? You should know that HF is a weak acid. Since it's a weak acid, that tells me the fluoride is a strong enough base to react with the hydronium from my perchloric acid. So that means the concentration of the fluoride would drop, and that would push the equilibrium to this direction. So that would solubilize more of the calcium fluoride. And so calcium fluoride will solubilize more when it's dissolved in a perchloric acid solution. Okay. Now, if you want to do it a really quick way, you could just say, well, the bromide and the chloride, those are the conjugate bases of strong acids. So those are not going to solubilize more. Right. And you would be 100 percent correct. And you could say all the other ones, the conjugate bases do not come from strong acids. And so they should react, right? Carbonate is the conjugate base of bicarbonate, HCO3. That's also a weak acid. Sulfide is the conjugate base of HS minus. That's definitely a weak acid, okay? And so again, all you have to do is look at the anions, and if the anions are the conjugate bases of weak acids, they're gonna react and it's gonna solubilize it more. Why? The same reason. You're gonna drop the concentration of those anions, which is gonna push the equilibrium to the right and dissolve more of the solid compound. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the concept. That was kind of a long explanation. I probably could have just said, you know, conjugate, uh, a conjugate base of weak acid is gonna be more soluble. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right. Well, with that in mind, I'm going to give you a second to think about number 103. It's the same question. Okay. We've got a 0 0.1. Nope. Not that concentrated. Come on, Mr. Dion. Get with the program. 0 0 0.01 um, molar solution of HClO4. And which one of these is going to have an enhanced solubility? So we've got silver bromide, barium fluoride, calcium Phosphate, come on. Uh, what else? We got zinc two, no, sorry, zinc sulfide and lead two iodide. I'm going to throw this out there to my students. Does anybody have an idea which one of these or any of these would be have an enhanced solubility in this in this acid in perchloric acid? I'm just curious if anybody is able to figure it out. Yeah, zinc sulfide for sure. I say zinc sulfide will. Any other ones? Yes, good. Okay, so barium fluoride, absolutely. Oops, absolutely for barium fluoride. Lead two iodide is not going to be more soluble. Lead two fluoride would, or lead two iodide would not be. Why? Because lead two iodide is comprised of lead two plus ions and iodide, right? Iodide is the conjugate base of HI, which is a strong acid. Okay, 
So that's not going to work. Is there another one in here that would be more solubilized or have great enhanced solubility? All you have to do is look at the anions. If the anion doesn't come from a strong acid, it's going to be more soluble. Look, bromide comes from HBr. That's a strong acid. Iodide comes from HI. That's a strong acid. Fluoride does not come from a strong acid. Sulfide does not come from a strong acid. What about phosphate? Yes or no? Will the phosphate have an enhanced solubility in acid? Yes or no? Do you see phosphate in this list? No, phosphate is not in that list. And so, yes, phosphate, because phosphoric acid is a weak acid or the conjugate acid of the phosphate ion, right, which is hydrogen phosphate. Okay, so what would be the conjugate acids of fluoride, phosphate, and sulfide? So you'd have HF, right, you'd have HPO4, 2 minus, and HS minus. These are all weak acids. Weak acids. Okay, again, all you have to do is look at the anions. If they're not in this list of anions, perchlorate, hydrogen sulfate, nitrate, iodide, bromide, chloride, it's going to dissolve more in acid. That's it. Okay, so look for that question. It's going to be on the practice exam if you haven't done it already. Okay, question number 101. I thought this was a good question for us to try because it comes from some kind of AP exam somewhere that's floundering around out in the ether in, in the country. It says this question was taken from a chemistry advanced placement exam used with the permission of the testing service. So if you have this equilibrium right here, it says a saturated solution of magnesium fluoride at 18 degrees Celsius. Um, in the saturated solution, the concentration of magnesium ions are 1.21 times 10 to minus 3 molar. Here's the equilibrium. It's already here. Write the expression for the KSP and calculate the KSP at 18 degrees Celsius. So let's start with that part. Okay, we'll start by evaluating the KSP. We have our equilibrium. Magnesium fluoride is going to be an equilibrium with magnesium ions and fluoride ions, okay? It, initially, we have none of this, or we have some of that, but we don't consider its concentration. We're going to lose some of this. We're going to gain some of this, and we're going to gain twice as much here because we have two fluorides for every magnesium and magnesium fluoride. So equilibrium, we're going to have X here, and we're going to have two X there, all right? Now you know what X is. X, they told you right here in the saturated solution, is 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. So if that's what X is, X is equal to the concentration of the magnesium ions, which is equal to 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. The concentration of fluoride ions is going to be equal to 2 times X, which equals 2 times 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3 molar, which is going to be equal to... 2.42 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. Now to evaluate the KSP, KSP is going to be equal to the concentration of magnesium ions times the concentration of fluoride ions squared. So that equals 1.21 times 10 to the negative 3 multiplied by 2.42 times 10 to the negative 3, all of that squared. And when you punch that in your calculator, you get that KSP is going to be equal to 7.09 times 10 to the negative 9. Notice that if you go into Appendix K and you look up, is it in here? Uh, or sorry, Appendix J, is it? Um, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing here. Um, there we go. It's Appendix J. So if you go into Appendix J in our textbook, and you look up magnesium fluoride. So I'm doing it right now. I'm scrolling down and I'm going to find magnesium fluoride. Where is it? Da, 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 da. Oh, good gravy, Mr. Dion. Da, da, da. Magnesium fluoride. Well, I guess it's not in there. 
Okay, but if you were to Google it, you'd want to be, oh, here it is, magnesium fluoride. In our, in Appendix J, Appendix J, it says the KSP is equal to 6.4 times 10 to the negative nine. Can anybody tell me what the discrepancy is? Why they're different? Thanks, Autumn. Can anybody tell me why they're different? Yes, exactly. Because they told you in this problem that you evaluated the KSP at 18 degrees Celsius. In Appendix J, the KSPs are provided for 25 degrees Celsius. So this is at 25 degrees Celsius. You want to be careful with stuff like that. Yes, all my students are oh good. My students are on the ball. Okay, they're like, come on, Mr. Dion. I know that equilibrium is affected by temperature. Good gravy. All right. Okay, so we figured out the KSP. We got that done. Now it's asking us in part B, it says calculate the equilibrium concentration of magnesium ions in a one liter, uh, in one liter of saturated magnesium fluoride solution at 18 degrees Celsius, in which you've already got 0.1 moles of potassium fluoride that's been added to the solution. Well, I think we already looked at potassium fluoride today, didn't we? We know that potassium fluoride is going to dissociate completely to give you potassium ions plus fluoride ions. I'm not going to draw the whole ice table because I went over this with you, I think, last lecture or the lecture before it, when we said, come on, if you start it with 0 0.100 moles, Right, of potassium fluoride, it dissociates completely to give you none of this, and then you'd have 0 0.100 moles of potassium ions and 0 0.100 moles of fluoride ions. The ones that we're going to be concerned with, though, are the fluoride ions because they're present in magnesium fluoride. So let's figure out what the initial concentration of the fluoride ions will be. It's pretty simple. We got 0.1 divided by our volume of 1. 0.000 liters, and we end up with 0 0.100 molar fluoride ions. So that means when we write out our expression for the magnesium fluoride, which is in equilibrium with aqueous magnesium ions plus two times the amount of fluoride ions, the initial concentration of our fluoride is 0 0.100 molar. So when we're setting up our ice table, we're going to say we're going to lose some of this, gain some of this, and gain 2x here. At equilibrium, we have a concentration that, or no concentration for the solid. We have x here. And I'm going to say that this is equal to 0 0.100. Why am I leaving out the 2x? Well, if you look at, again, our KSP from the previous slide, it was 7.09 times 10 to the negative 9. This is much greater than 100 times the KSP. And so we can ignore the change in the concentration of the fluoride ions. Well, let's set up our expression, our KSP, which again, we know is equal to the concentration of magnesium ions times the concentration of fluoride ions. 7.09 times 10 to the negative 9 is going to be equal to x times 0 0.100 squared. So we get that x is equal to 7.09 times 10 to the negative 9 divided by 0 0.01. And we get that x is equal to 7.09 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. And that will be equal to the concentration of our magnesium ions. Like that. There we go. If you want to check it, you know, if you're kind of obsessed with checking it, you can just do this. You say, 7.09 times 10 to the negative 7 divided by 0 0.100 multiplied by 100%. And make sure it's not greater than a 5% dissociation. So we have 7.09 times 10 to the negative 7. Negative 7 divided by 0.1. And we end up with 7.09 times 10 to the negative 6 percent and so that is a lot less than five percent and so our assumption is totally fine well now we're on to the last part of this problem it says predict whether you're going to get a precipitate forming precipitate of magnesium fluoride to form when you mix 100 milliliters of a three 
0.00 times 10 to the negative three molar solution of magnesium nitrate with a two, with 200 milliliters of a 200 or two times 10 to the negative three molar solution of sodium fluoride solution. So all we need to do is evaluate the concentration of magnesium and fluoride in this solution and then calculate the Q, right? So let's start with our magnesium nitrate. We know that magnesium, and I'm not going to draw a nice table for the whole thing because I'm pretty sure most of my students are following me on this. Magnesium nitrate is going to dissociate to give you magnesium ions plus twice the amount of nitrate ions. What's the initial amount of magnesium in terms of the number of moles? Well, we have a 3.00 times 10 to the negative 3 mole per liter solution, and we're adding 100 mils of it, so that's 0 0.1000 liters. Liters cancel, and we're left over with 3.00 times 10 to the negative 4 moles. Now, since this is going to dissociate completely, we're going to end up with 3.00 times 10 to the negative 4 moles of magnesium ions. All right. We're going to do the same exercise now for the sodium fluoride. My sodium fluoride is going to dissociate completely to give me sodium ions plus fluoride ions. What's the initial amount of sodium that I'm starting out with? The concentration is 2.0 times 2.00 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter. I'm adding 200 milliliters this time, so multiplied by 0 0.2000 liters. This cancels, and I'm left over with 4.00 times 10 to the negative 4 moles. So again, since it's 100% dissociation, Again, I'm not going to worry about the sodium ions because they've got nothing to do with the KSB of magnesium fluoride, but I'm going to end up with 4.00 times 10 to the negative 4 moles of fluoride. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me this far, or stop me if you have a question about where we are now. Sorry, I lost my spot here. Where was I? Okay, somewhere around here. Okay, good. All right, all we're evaluating is the concentration of the magnesium and fluoride ions, but we don't have that established, do we? Right, we don't have the concentration of magnesium ions or fluoride ions. All we know are the number of moles. Well, moles divided by volume will give us the concentration. But remember, since we're mixing two solutions, we've got to take into account the volume of both of those solutions. So since 100, 100 milliliters, milliliters plus 200 milliliters equals 300 milliliters. This is my total volume. That's equal to 0 0.3000 milliliters. So I'm going to divide both of these by 0 0.3000 liters. I get that the concentration of my magnesium ions are 1.00 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. I do the same thing with my fluoride divided by 0 0.3000 liters. I get that the concentration of my fluoride ions is 1.33 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. Now I can evaluate my Q and compare it to my K. So my Q is going to be equal to the concentration of the magnesium ions multiplied by the concentration of the fluoride ions squared which is going to be equal to 1.00 times 10 to the negative 3 multiplied by 1.33 times 10 to the negative 3 squared. I get that my Q is equal to 3 sig figs, so it's 1.78 times 10 to the negative 9. Now remember, my KSP was equal to 7.09 times 10 to the negative 9. And so my Q is less than my KSP. Therefore, based off of what we learned earlier on in this class, will the precipitate form yes or no? If Q is less than K.
will a precipitate form if Q is less than K? Exactly. Thanks, Jamil. No precipitate will form because Q is less than K. All right, great. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Warren. Perfect. Thanks, Amanda. Excellent, excellent. Here we go. So here we go. We solved an AP level problem. Uh, let's see here. Question 94, I think, is a good one. Let's try question number 24. Um, or 94. Did I say 24? What yeah, let's give this one a try. It says, calculate the molar solubility of calcium chloride in a 0 0.100 molar solution of HF. Gives you the Ka for HF, and um, it gives you the Ksp for calcium chloride. Well, if I have, and I'm going to go over this one a little bit quicker. I'm going to assume that my students understand that if I have HF, it's a weak acid. So this is another common ion effect, but I need to determine the concentration of fluoride in my 0.1 molar solution of HF. So let's start by making an ice table. We have HF, which again is a weak acid. It's a dangerous acid, but it's a weak acid. Very dangerous, especially if you've seen Breaking Bad. Has anybody seen what they do with the hydrofluoric acid? It's a little far-fetched, but 0 0.100 molar. There we go. So we have our initial concentration of 0.1 molar. We're going to lose some of that. We're going to gain some of this, and we're going to gain some fluoride as well. And then at equilibrium, we're going to have, I'm going to assume this is 0 0.100 molar. I'm going to assume that I have X for both of these. So if we know that our Ka for HF is equal to the concentration of protons multiplied by the concentration of fluoride ions divided by the concentration of HF, we get that our Ka, which is 6.4 times 10 to the negative 4, is equal to X squared over 0 0.100 molar. And then when you solve for x, you get that x is equal to 8, which would be equal to the concentration of fluoride and the concentration of protons. But you get that it's equal to 8.0 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. Now, if you look at these two numbers, they're not that far off. So let's do a check. Okay, if you check it out, you see that 8.0 times 10 to the negative 3 divided by 6.4 times 10 to the negative 4 multiplied by 100%. And when we do that, we get 8%. Okay, so this means assumption is not valid and we must solve, solve the quadratic equation in order to get an accurate value of x. So now I'm going to rework this and I'm going to say subtract X and then I'm going to reevaluate my Ka. 6.4 times 10 to the negative 4 is equal to X squared divided by 0 0.100 minus X. So I worked a lot of this out already and you end up with 6.4 times 10 to the negative 5, right? Because you're multiplying by 0.1. Subtract 6.4 times 10 to the negative 4x is equal to x squared. So then you get that 0 is equal to x squared plus 6.4 times 10 to the negative 4x. Subtract 6.4 times 10 to the negative 5, like that. Then we solve the quadratic for x. I already went ahead and solved the quadratic formula for x and you get the x is equal to 0 0.0077 molar like that so now we know the concentration of our protons and we also know the concentration of our fluoride ions and that's what we were interested in to solve for the molar solubility of the calcium fluoride given the initial concentration of our common ion so 
if we write out the equilibrium expression for our calcium fluoride, calcium fluoride is in equilibrium with calcium ions plus twice as many fluoride ions. We get that initially we have a concentration of fluoride that is 0 0.0077 molar. We have a change in an equilibrium. We're going to have X and we're going to assume that this is 0 0.0077. Right, because that concentration is much bigger than 100 times, way, way, way bigger than 100 times our KSP. So we get that our KSP, which is equal to the concentration of the calcium multiplied by the concentration of the fluoride ions squared, 4.0 times 10 to the negative 11 is going to be equal to x times 0 0.0077 squared. And we get the x, which is equal to the concentration of our calcium at equilibrium, which is equal to the molar solubility, right? This is the molar solubility, how much of that was lost or, or went into solution, I should say. Um, and when we work that out, we take, and I need to double check my answer, 4 times 10 to the negative 11. 11 come on. 4 times 10 to the negative 11, there we go, divided by 0 0.0077 squared. And I get 6.7 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. And so that is the molar solubility of our calcium fluoride in that solution of HF. All right, here we go. What makes this a more interesting common ion effect problem, in my opinion, in Mr. Dion's opinion, is because when you have something like potassium fluoride, that's 100% ionic, right? That dissociates 100%. Whereas when you have something like HF, it gets more interesting because then you have to consider the Ka of the weak acid, right? So that goes back to chapter 14. So this is kind of a combination of chapter 14 and chapter 15 all wrapped up into one problem. Well, let's take a look at one more problem. And I, I wanted to end today's lecture talking about a buffer problem. Now, if you look at the solutions manual, the way that they solve this problem is a little different than the way that I'm going to do it. But I want you to understand the Henderson Hasselbach equation. So, what section was that in? Let me double check here. It's in chapter 14. Um, so, if you go in the buffer section, uh, I just want to be double sure that's where it is. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, so the Henderson-Hasselbach equation is in section 14.6. So we looked at the Henderson-Hasselbach equation for an acid, but we also derived it. If you remember in the slides of chapter 14, we derived the Henderson-Hasselbach equation for, um, for a base. So that was something that we did, um, I don't know, one day in class, we did it really quickly. We derived the Henderson Hasselbach equation for a base, which is which would be useful here. And you could solve this using the Henderson Hasselbach equation using pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the con conjugate base concentration divided by um, the uh, the uh, weak acid concentration. That will totally work. There's no problem with that at all. But if you want to solve this problem using the Henderson Hasselbach equation um, using the other form. That'll work too. Using the POH is equal to PKB form, that will work too. Sorry, I was just looking for something in my notes here. All right. All right. Anyhow, uh, where was I? So it says calculate the molar solubility of tin 2 hydroxide in a buffer 
solution containing equal concentrations of ammonia and ammonium ion. So this is something that I want to draw your attention to because you need to be pretty quick at identifying that in this case, that pH is going to be equal to the pKa and that pOH would be equal to the pKb, right? Because we spent some time looking at this in class. So if you look at the henderson hasselbalch equation, it's pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the concentration of conjugate base over weak acid. Or we derived it for using pKb, and we said that pOH is equal to pKb plus the log of the concentration of the conjugate acid divided by the concentration of the base. Okay, so we did both of those in class, and so. You could use either one of these technically in here, but what I want you to know is that you could use either one. I decided to use the POH formula. Again, you can use the pH formula. It will totally work. The way they do it in the book is a little bit different, but I want to show you how I would have done this when I was a student. So if we have tin 2 hydroxide, which is a solid in equilibrium with tin two ions and two times the amount of hydroxide ions. Since we know that we're in a buffer solution, we need to figure out what the pH of that buffer solution is so that we can calculate the concentration of hydroxide, right? This is a common ion problem, really, when you boil it down. So you have to go into the appendix to look up uh, the KSP for tin 2 hydroxide, so KSP, and again, this comes from the appendices at the back of the book, it's 3 times 10 to the negative 27. Then I went and looked up the PK, PKB, so the PKB for ammonia is equal to, what was it? I have it written down here somewhere. It's um, 1.8. 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Sorry, I can't read my writing here. I need to be 100% sure. Can everybody else corroborate my PKB? I just want to be 100% sure before I start fiddling around. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so my PKB is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. All right, so let's use this formula right here. And I already see that I put PKA in there when I meant to put PKB. So if we have this formula, pOH is equal to pKb plus the log of the concentration of the conjugate acid divided by the concentration of the base. If these are equal, that's going to give you 1, and the log of 1 is 0, so that cancels that out. Therefore, the pOH is going to be equal to the pKb. That means that the concentration of the hydroxide is going to be equal to 10 to the negative pOH or 10 to the negative pKb. 10 to the negative pKb. pKb, why do I keep writing pKa? So I get 10 to the negative. Shit. Sorry, you guys, I'm tired. So I get that my pOH is going to be equal to the negative log of the concentration of the hydroxide, which is going to be equal to which is going to be equal to the negative log of my Kb. It's not a pKb, it's a Kb. All right, so I get that my pOH is going to be equal to the negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. When you do that, you get that pOH is equal to 4.74. Then you get that the concentration of hydroxide is going to be equal to 10 to the negative pOH, which is equal to 10 to the negative 4.74. You get that the concentration of your hydroxide ions initially is going to be 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. That was a pretty freaking long way to figure out that the concentration of the hydroxide is the same as the 
KB. If you can draw that conclusion quickly, be my guest, go for it, that's great. But if you can't, that's fine too. So I'm already running out of space here. So let's go to a blank document here and let's finish up this problem. So I'll write at the equilibrium for my tin two hydroxide again. So I've got my tin two hydroxide in equilibrium with tin ions plus twice the amount of hydroxide ions. Initially, I have none of this. I have 1.8 times 10 to the negative five molar of this. I get some kind of change plus 2x here. I get that at equilibrium, I have x and I have 1.8 times 10 to the negative five. I'm gonna leave the 2x out because my uh, my KSP is so low, right? The KSP, which is the concentration of tin two plus ions times the concentration of hydroxide ions squared is equal to three times 10 to the negative 27. I mean, that's so small. It's so small that the two X is gonna be irrelevant in this case. And so that I get that three times 10 to the negative 27 is gonna be equal to X times 1.8 times 10 to the negative five squared and I get the X which is equal to the concentration of the tin two plus ions is equal to nine times 10 to the negative 18 molar. Just like that. Okay. All right, there we go. So that is the final answer.